So we're going to have a little bit of sound issues because we thought we were going to have a lapel mic. But if, what I'm going to ask is anybody in the back, whenever you can't hear, just like wave your hand or put your hand up to your ear or something, okay? Can you hear me right now, Chanti? Yeah, no, okay. 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 <clears throat> I see it. Yeah, I can see you. I can see you. So because sometimes people say, can you hear me? And everybody says yes. And then they go back to talking like this. Thank so you, anyway. Chanti. There's one in every crowd. <laughs> Um, yeah. So anyway, that's that's because like the first thing I want to do is thank um, the Whalen Library. I want to thank Rachel for the great introduction. Steve Engler put together the whole Great Presenters um, flyer that's out and really worked with me to get it down to I think eight lines and uh, was very encouraging about that and helped me and even with last minute changes. And um, Andrea Case and the rest of the Great Presenters Committee, but Andrea especially put my name forward, saying like, Stephen and Jane might be a good talk. And I said, well, you're really scraping the barrel after you've done the, <laughs> the famous authors that live in Wayland and everything. But we're, we're really happy to be here. So thank you very much. So we're going to kick off with a, with a video. And the sound on this, I try to be quiet, because we're coming a little. Ask you to come up here for a minute. The sound may not be so loud, so if you we're starting, since we're talking about uh, ALS, and I assume most of you in the room are familiar with what happened uh, three years ago this summer, the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. So we figured that uh, no better way to start than to show our Ice Bucket Challenge. <laughs> Hi everybody, this is Stephen Winthrop. I'm here to respond to the Ice Bucket Challenge, which many of you may have heard about. It's been spreading a lot of interest and awareness and raising a lot of money for ALS research. You may or may not know that I was diagnosed with ALS about a year, about 10 months ago. And so I'm unable to lift the bucket over my head. But thanks to my friend Brad, who built this contraption, and thanks to my two able assistants here, in a couple of minutes, I'm going to be pulling this rope and all in the interest of ALS research dunking this ice water over my head. Um, but first, I put together some of the, the late, some late information about ALS. And if you have about 15 or 20 minutes of your time, I'd like to share with you some of the latest research findings. So, for example, did you know what? <laughs> oh. Oh, I'm gonna make sure we don't do it, John. Uh, that's doubly appropriate given the fact that for anybody who knows me well knows that I can sometimes go on for longer than <laughs> people expect me to. Um, so, um, <coughs> but thank you all for being here. Um, Jane and I are going to be tag teaming back and forth, um, uh, telling you a little bit about our story, about ALS, and about what we've been doing. Actually, as you'll hear in a minute, yesterday was the four-year anniversary of when I was diagnosed. So it's a, it's a date that we have circled on the calendar in our, in our family. But Jane, why don't you take it? I was just going to say, look how cute we are, right? Um, <laughs> this is the picture you used in the flyer that I, I sent to Steve that was in the flyer, but I thought you could see the whole thing. This was part of a photo shoot, and it's amazing what a photo shoot can do for you. I'm just saying. It was for the Mass General Magazine, um, because we were going to be there. We are their cover story right now for the current issue. And um, we have many copies of it scattered around. If <laughs> there are some at the back, on the cookie table, please feel free to take one if you haven't seen it. Um, what you get that you don't get online is the cover picture. Um, so, this is yours, I think. <laughs> um, Jane and I, uh, some of you may know, we're, we're classmates in college, and as chance would have it, our pictures in a, in a uh, Harvard class of almost 1,600 people, our pictures were right next to each other in our yearbook. <laughs> and that's extra remarkable because we didn't go out on a single date as undergrad.
Sorry about that. So as I said a minute ago, everybody can hear me now? As I said a minute ago, yesterday was the, uh, the four-year anniversary of my diagnosis. I had, um, uh, my, my journey with ALS had started harmlessly enough when I had some uh, twitches in my left arm starting in 2011 that I paid very little attention to because I thought, well, who hasn't had a muscle twitch? Um, and uh, about a year later, I started to take it a little bit more seriously because I was aware of some weakness in that left arm, and I am, or I, I was, a southpaw. So I thought that was unusual to have weakness in my dominant arm. Um, visit to my general practitioner, to a lot of other um, doctors and specialists along the way. Uh, I followed a very similar path to, to um, others with ALS, with it being about nine months from when I first saw a doctor. Uh, to when I received the diagnosis. And that's because without getting too deep into the science of it, um, this is what's called a differential diagnosis, which means that there's nothing you can look at under a microscope, no blood test, nothing that says ALS, that you instead have to rule out uh, the more common and then the next most common and then the next most common um, thing that might be causing those symptoms. And to make it even more confounding, the symptoms are very, very, um, they're all over the place because the disease um, can start in a different part of the body from one patient to another. It can move at a different rate. It affects um, people as young as teenagers and as old as people in their 80s, although most commonly it's people in their um, sort of mid-40s to mid-60s. Um, and um, yes. So. Um, when I uh, talk with other patients, other people who have ALS, I ask them, what's the hardest thing to get across to people about having ALS? And one part of it is simply explaining what it is doing in the body. It's not an easily explained disease because it in involves the death of cells that I'd never heard of called motor neuron cells that we all have in the spine and in the brain. Um, it is a painless, uh, progressive weakening of muscles. Um, so here I am, I was talking about the twitching and I thought it was nothing. And I, was, I was not in any pain, I'm still not in any pain, um, except for an occasional muscle spasm. Um, you don't lose any sensation in the parts of your body that are affected. You don't get tingling or numbness or anything else like that. It's, um, it's uh, in effect what's happening is that the muscles are being starved of their nutrients to keep muscles strong and as a result they weaken and they get smaller and they harden. Yeah. Um, so what we asked of course right that night is the, the bottom line there, right? That's, that's the big question of how long do I have? And um, so as you can see it m moves really rapidly um, but 10% of the patients live longer than 10 years. And as I say, then there's this guy, <coughs> right? So he's the outlier of the outliers. Stephen Hawking has been living with um, MND, which is in the UK, they call it motor neuron disease instead of ALS. He's been living with this for uh, 50 years plus. Um, no one else comes close. Motor neuron disease in the US is a umbrella term. So ALS is one of the motor neuron diseases. So there's a little bit of a question by some American doctors whether he has maybe something that is awful but is not the same disease that we're talking about with ALS. Um, but that points out that it does have different names in different countries. When we went to France, we learned it's uh, Charcot's disease or Maladie de Charcot um, because uh, Charcot actually discovered it and, name and gave it a name in the 1860s. I think so um, yeah so different people but there's the guy so you just been told you have this disease and now what um, I'm gonna pull this out and hold it for a second here oh sorry about the noise okay um, so like any bad news I mean you cry you scream you rant um, you wallow 
a bit. Um, and then for us, we decided then after we'd done a lot of that to go forward and to try to be constructive with what we could do next. Um, and I wanna stop right here as to quote Stephen in something he says a lot, which is we pass no judgment on people who don't do that. There are a lot of people who get this disease who wanna curl up in a fetal position and just make the world go away. And that's, that's not better, that's not worse. That's what they've done with a slower progression, which Stephen has. It may be easier to stay positive and do more things, but I'm just saying that this is the approach we took. It keeps us sane, it keeps us being parents and living lives and giving presentations to you all. Um, we thought we had about four, I think it's four, maybe five, overarching principles in how we decided to go forward. Um, one was to be very open and ask for support. And um, this is much easier after the ice bucket challenge, but Stephen was diagnosed before. And before then, a lot of people have been very um, secretive about ALS, almost, it sounds peculiar, but shameful. People at felt ashamed of having a disease. It doesn't look so great when you um, are cramping or when you can't hold something up or someone's feeding you. That's really changed a lot since the Ice Bucket Challenge. It's one of the best things that's happened since then. But we decided to just lay it out there. We sent an e-blast to a lot of people telling them, this is the news, we'd love your support, and answering questions that we knew would come up a lot, like, how long do you have? And we said, well, you know, nobody knows yet, and this is what's out there. And one thing we put right out there was what people could do for us, because that is the first question after how long do you have. People do say, what can I do? What can I do, right? I mean, this is when you're sick, anything. People say, what can I do? So we had very specific suggestions on that. I remember the very first thing we said was, please don't phone us. We'll be happy to call you, but we could be in the middle of doing something very present moment and um, it kind of interrupts it to be like, right, I'm gonna tell my story again, bring you back back down. So that was, that was a self-protective mechanism we did. We talked about favors people could do and we've continued to reach out and be very frank with people. Being open um, has helped us staying positive. Um, Stephen's motto quickly became acceptance without resignation. Um, not denying the disease, but so certainly accepting it, but not resigning oneself to it. Uh, one person sitting here in the audience gave us a book early on called How to Be Sick. And uh, <laughs> it sounds a bit, what? But actually, if you're going to be sick, chronically sick, then you can decide how you're gonna deal with it. You, you know, if you're gonna have a lot of bad things happen, you can balance it with the good stuff. Um, and we decided to share everything we'd learned because there was too much reinventing the wheel. We, every time we tried to figure something out, every patient is out there becoming their own MacGyver, trying to create the tool that will help them do this or trying to figure out what to do with something that's complicated or that they can't do anymore. And we decided this is nuts, we'll get it on the internet, we'll share, share, share some of what we're doing tonight. Um, this also prevents feelings of isolation, which is another problem that happens with a disease like this. The inner work, do the inner work. Um, the, for us, that meant balancing your bucket list. Doing some of those bucket list trips, we did um, Europe 101 with our kids. We then did a, Stephen did a trip to Japan with Casey and a trip uh, to Australia with Hannah. And other, we just went to the solar, the total eclipse. We went out to um, Missouri to see the true totality. The sort of, but balancing that with living in the now. You know, if you're always thinking ahead or trying to escape what is now, it's sort of a Buddhist thought, but trying to find that, that balance with being present, but also enjoying and then planning. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and uh, Stephen in spoke at our Harvard reunion, I think it was two years ago, on a panel uh, called Bouncing Back from Dealing with Adversity. And there was someone who had you know, lived through Hurricane Katrina, and there was someone who had lost a son, and there was these things, and like, well, I don't know if you bounce back, but it was about dealing with it, and that was um, why, we, why you were there. So um, instead of giving in to the disease, 
um, and just feeling helpless and powerless, we, um, we try to find areas and activities where we can have an impact and have some control, or what I call empowerment. So um, this is our logo. We came up with Will Win because I'm Williamson and he's Winthrop and that had always been my email and it seemed kind of positive. Um, so we will win against ALS. And um, a friend of a friend, Nancy Dobos, designed this um, logo for us for free. She's a graphic designer. And um, I love it. You know, the person's breaking through the finish line, the two WWs, it's not Weight Watchers, it's us. <laughs> Best of all, it's purple. Um, we love it. So this has gone on our T-shirts we've used for the walk. We um, have it on the website. It's, um, and that, it just is encapsulates that empowerment feeling that we're looking for. So, I, I don't want to read to you things that are on the slides when they're really easy to understand. I hate that, actually, when people put it up and then read it to you. But these are our four focuses of what we've done, given that oh, those overarching principles. And that's what, this is sort of the outline of what we're going to talk about tonight. Okay, one more slide for me, and then it's back to you. Um, oh, education and awareness. Talking, 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 talking. We do a lot of that. Um, now, two terms you're, I want to define for you. The third line down that we've spoken to biotech firms from the PALS and CALS perspectives. These are terms that have come up um, long before Stephen was diagnosed. PALS is a person with ALS, not a patient. Don't want to be considered a patient. They're people who have a disease. And uh, CALS are caregivers of those with ALS. So that's just a shorthand because it's a lot to say a caregiver of someone with ALS that we, we tend to use as other people, PALS and CALS. Um, so the biotech firms, why Stephen has been <laughs> speaking there, why I'm now speaking with him there, um, they, want, they often want to get the, the patient's perspective. They're designing a clinical trial. What would you, speaking for all patients out there, think of this? And that's, of course, the first thing we say is we're not going to speak for all patients out there, but here are our thoughts. And so um, Stephen's become quite in demand. I say he makes them laugh, he makes them cry, they give him a standing ovation. And um, pretty quickly they wanted to talk with me also because, from the, because um, a person with ALS needs their cows and you work together as a duo. You're, you just have to have this team, whether you're married or whether it's someone you're hiring, that's just how it goes. And so I'm often telling them, well, yes, this trial design you have is great, except that if we're going to be there overnight and into the next morning, who's taking care of my kids, driving them to school? Who's walking my dogs? You know, who's going to make sure this, this, and this happen just because you paid for our hotel and um, airfare? There's other things to think about because it is a family system. Um, and the second to last line, the new house. So we built a new house. Um, and it's very ALS friendly. It's a universal design house. So it's also age in place. It's good for, the point of universal design is it's good for pretty much everybody. And um, we freely share everything. We wanted to open source our plans, but frankly, we designed it as we went. We didn't have time to um, go longer, so there really aren't any <laughs> final blueprints to share, but we give tours to anyone who, um, who wants to know about it, people, people who've been disabled, definitely ALS people and, in the, and the caregivers and the medical professionals have been very interested in what we've done, and, um, but also other people with disabilities have been interested, so we've been doing that. Um, with the help of Kim Reichelt, we created a website which I'm not going to click on the link because when I did that in practice, it completely freaked out and it didn't let me come back to the presentation. But it's willwinagainstals.org. That's pretty easy. And our Facebook page is, guess what? Will win against ALS, right? So um, it's pretty easy to find. So, um, but yeah, many, many tours of the house. Um, and there's the most famous one. Uh, Kurt Schilling and Shonda uh, came to our house. Um, Politics aside, 
<coughs> which we did not talk politics. He is tireless and generous about ALS and has been since the beginning of his career. He was, um, they were introduced to us by um, a woman who works at the Philadelphia chapter of the ALS Association, and she's been working with them since the 80s. When he was a very young pitcher, he started with the Philadelphia Phillies. And the Phillies made ALS their cause. That, that was going to be their charity. Like we have the Jimmy Fund for the Red Sox. It's, it's that. And Kurt just dove into it. And he was giving how much per strikeout to ALS research? I think it was $250 per win and $100 per strikeout, which, which I would say for a rookie pitcher, he had no, I no idea how long his career was going to last. Um, what's extraordinary is that neither he nor anyone in his family had been touched by ALS. And he made this commitment, and he honored it for his entire career. So it, it translated into uh, oh, uh, you know, six figures of, of, uh, of donations. Because he was quite the strikeout pitcher, as you remember, right? So um, that's a picture of our house, by the way, that um, it's a, there's a very large one first floor, um, and it's a level entry. You can see there's no steps up into the front door and there's a lot more about it but that's that's what we worked really hard to create and I will say I have to tell one story about Kurt though because I did not know this we all remember the maybe you don't the bloody sock yeah. ah I love it that you do so <coughs> when Kurt uh, was coming out in the 2004 remember, right, series and he and he knew he'd had the surgery and he was coming out and he knew that the cameras were going to be zooming in on that ankle where he'd had the surgery um, and he took a Sharpie, a silver Sharpie, and on his cleats on the side, he wrote K for strikeout, ALS. Right there on the side of his, sh of his cleat, because he knew the cameras were going to come in and focus on it. And we all did, right? I wasn't focusing on the K ALS, I must admit. But it shows some of the savvy, savviness. He just felt like, hey, you know, and I, I just love that footnote because I wasn't paying any attention to ALS at the time but that that's something he did. Speaking of baseball, um, most of all, something we haven't mentioned yet is that most of all of you uh, probably know that ALS for a long time here in the U.S. has been known by another name as Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, and one of the things that the Ice Bucket Challenge did, interestingly, in terms of awareness, is um, ALS, those three letters, became um, a household phrase that most people understood. They may not understand all the nitty gritty of the disease, but they knew that it was an awful disease. Um, they knew it didn't stand for Albany Law School, where, where Jane's brother went to law school. So he, he had to change his cheer from, go ALS! Um, uh, uh, but um, Kurt Schilling, one of his sons is named Gehrig, Gehrig Schilling. I mean, that's, that's a, one indication of the depth of his, his uh, commitment. Um, and I happen to be a baseball nut myself, so uh, meeting Kurt Schilling was, was a, 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 I was deeply torn, and thankfully we didn't get into the politics, so I was instead I was able to look at him as a, as a baseball hero. Um, we have been to ALS Awareness Day at Fenway Park. The picture on the right, uh, the, 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 the um, which is up on the Jumbotron at Fenway. I'm the second from the left there. Um, and um, I, um, I think I may perhaps be, this is a little bit of braggadocia, but this spring I managed to snag a foul ball with my feet. <laughs> I think I'm the first person with ALS to do so. <laughs> Um, we've already mentioned, uh, I've agreed to somewhat against my nature to, to really open myself up to interviews and talking with the media. Um, this Labor Day, I was quite surprised to find myself on the cover of the Boston Herald. Um, uh, but uh, a friend of mine, a very good friend of mine, um, in one of my more important conversations after my diagnosis, who asked me, what do you want to do? What do you want to happen? And I said, I want to uh, make an impact. 
And he said to me, in language I can't share here, uh, you need to lose that Yankee reserved reticence about the media. And you have to be ready to make it personal, to put a face and a name on the disease. And I remember sitting one night at dinner, um, talking with Jane and the kids and saying, you know, things are going to change. And if the phone rings and it's Channel 5 and they want to interview me, I'm going to say yes. And that has, in fact, happened. So these are here side by side because they're the two biggest ones, I think. Um, I mentioned that that magazine is out there. Anybody want one? You can take it. <laughs> they came by Courier yesterday, so we would have bunches of copies for you. And this one as well. This, this talk actually is the first time that we've done a whole summary of everything we've done in the last four years. We've never done that. And it was eye-opening. It was exhausting. Um, when we listed everything we'd accomplished and, and presented at and, and talked, it was um, humbling. And, and, um, and of course, here's awareness, right? Here we are talking to you. And that's going to be one of our messages going forth is keep talking. Right? I joined the, the national board of the ALS Association in um, the beginning of 2015. And at that point, I could move through life um, without anybody, any casual observer, knowing there was anything going on with my body. Uh, and I spoke with the people at the ALS Association, and I said, you know, there are some people with ALS like me who want to um, take advantage of certain situations. The classic one for me is going through security at the airport and getting on an airplane, where I can wear this button and I don't have to go into a long explanation with the flight attendant to help them put my bag overhead, or I don't have to explain why I may need other assistance in going through um, the TSA security. So I said, um, um, and it, I, I asked the folks at the ALS Association, can, can we make these buttons up? Now, granted, of course, these, will n these buttons do not work for the, the, the people with ALS where their symptoms start in their mouth and throat, which is, there's, it, it's a horrible, um, horrible form of ALS. That's uh, called bulbar onset, referring to the, the, that region of the mouth. And those people in the early stages of their disease um, have people thinking that they're either drunk or stupid because there's of the way their speech is affected. And um, uh, imagine have to having to explain yourself out of that situation all the time. So I would not wear the, um, this button most of the time. But uh, I decided, you know, if I'm on an airplane and if I can spark one conversation with the person sitting next to me and that leads to um, a discussion around the dinner table. One time, I actually was sitting next to a um, uh, a Needham school teacher, a middle school school t a school teacher, and that led to her connecting with a doctor at Mass General to come and talk to her class. So you know that's a big win. So these buttons have now been, as you can see on the right, uh, produced in in uh, in large numbers, and um, when we have our uh, walks to defeat ALS around the country, people with the ALS can, can wear the button. And it's an invitation, as you can read from the language. It's an invitation of saying, it's OK. You can ask me. I'm here to talk about it. Um, research is um, something we could talk about for a couple of hours, because the, um, we but we won't. <laughs> um, uh, I decided right away that I was going to, um, well, we decided two things. There, there's uh, the ultimate dilemma of if you're going to be giving money to, an to, to a cause like fighting ALS, do you want to be helping th those people who are um, fighting the disease now? Or do you want to be focusing on research which may not help those living with the disease now? Um, but Jane and I very quickly decided that um, Frankly, there's nothing more important than wiping this horrible disease off the face of the earth. And uh, we've thrown ourselves into research in a number of ways. I've um, 
recently participated in my 20th clinical trial. Uh, Jane has been, as a healthy um, control, has been in five uh, trials herself. Um, and we've also uh, um, uh, spoken with anybody who will listen because I've now been poked and prodded and scanned and um, tested with various drugs. Uh, so some of those biotech firms have, have asked us, so do you think this particular protocol will, um, will work? Do you think it'll scare people away? And we, we're, we were in one situation where I said, yeah, having people come in for a lumbar puncture once a month and have spinal fluid extracted, that once a month is a little bit too much. <laughs> I've had it done, I think, four or five times now, all without complication or incident, but it's no picnic. Um, and so we've provided that, that input as well. Um, you should say that, I'm just, I'm gonna add here that um, of those 20 clinical trials, I think three or four are what we call intervention trials. That's where, you know, there is a treatment they're gonna try. Might get the placebo, you might not. Sometimes there is no placebo because it's something that they know is efficacious for other things. There's one drug that's like a really bad blood pressure drug. It passed the FDA, but no one wants to take it. It's, it's there's so many better ones. They're trying it out on ALS. But the other 16 or 17 trials for Stephen have been observational and longitudinal. And there are a couple reasons people do that. I'm standing in the middle. Um, a couple reasons people do that. Um, it's to advance the science. So it is for the greater good, you could say. But also, we were told early on that um, people who participate in clinical trials, even if they get the placebo, sometimes especially if they get the placebo, uh, do better than those who don't. So it actually helps you to be part of it. You're ta you're taking, you have your own agency. You're taking more control of um, your, uh, your fate. Uh, about um, four or five of those observational trials have involved um, injecting uh, radioactive isotope into my veins and then sticking me inside an MRI machine for uh, 90 minutes, two hours, uh, PET scan, MRI, uh, CAT scan, because they're finding that parts of the brain in people with ALS um, fire up in a very distinct way and that that may help as a diagnostic tool or also to see if a particular drug is, is working. So. Um, the observational term implies oh, all they're really doing is just watching you wither up and, and uh, in advance. It's more than that. And um, one of the things I do in talking with um, other people with ALS is, is say, you know, of the trials I've been in, some of them are one and done and painless. Some of them I don't even have to leave my house. Uh, others are much more rigorous. And, you know, please, please participate in some way in some trials out there, because that's how we're advancing knowledge. This is a picture of um, about 16 um, ALS patients and or their caregivers in Clearwater, Florida, um, which is um, a program run by an organization originated here in Boston, uh, centered around two concepts, um, uh, training people what it means to be an ambassador to go out there and uh, make yourself known to your members of Congress. Um, write columns in the paper. Tell them where you are. Tell them where uh, we are um, in the back row towards the left. Jane is wearing a white shirt, and I'm there. just uh, sort of behind and to the right. Um, the other thing that we went through in this weekend of training was um, uh, just a very quick um, exercise to discern um, a, um, what makes a good clinical trial good and what makes um, quackery quackery. I will point out that the person who ran that section of the trial is the son-in-law of Colin Jenny Steele here in the front row. Small world. He's standing in front of the potted palm there. <coughs> I mentioned earlier the connection between Lou Gehrig and ALS. Um, and uh, one of the other things that's unusual about ALS is that it is, um, because it's not contagious, 
it's not deemed to be a reportable disease, which means that doctors are not required to report it to any central entity. So as odd as it sounds in the 21st century America, we really don't know, for example, how many people in the United States have ALS. Estimates range from 20 to 35,000. Um, but one program that the Centers for Disease Control launched several years ago is a, an online registry. Um, the, the, um, it's a mouthful, but the, the ALS registry at the Centers for Disease Control. And um, they're asking that every patient enroll there. S thus far, about s um, right now, I think there are about 16,000 uh, registered there. Um, and it's also a place where uh, a resource where, where patients can learn about, you see, I'm using the word patient. I don't mind using the word patient, but, but some people with ALS don't like it. But for lack of a better term, I'll use it. Um, and then I've also been asked to join a committee that, um, that reviews uh, prospective clinical trials to see whether they um, clear the bar to be included in the registry and to be, um, for word to be sent out to all of those 16,000 patients that uh, this is a new clinical trial. It's just, just one of these notices went out yesterday. Uh, this is a new trial. Um, these are the places where uh, the trial is enro enrolling participants. Uh, these are the inclusion or exclusion criteria and so on and so forth. Um, this past summer, I was asked to um, be one of the leaders of, a, um, of an online webinar. Are all of you familiar with the term webinar? Um, actually, it's a perfect technology for people with ALS because for those who can't speak, they can communicate either through their fingers or through eye gaze technology. For those who, uh, um, so it's, it's, a, it's sort of a level playing field so everybody can participate. And this particular trial, um, I participated in about three summers ago um, where I went through um, a lot. I went through a lot. <laughs> uh, and it was a very, very complicated set of uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria. And I was the first patient enrolled at the first center that was approved. So they were, they were learning a lot on me. <laughs> So the visits that we thought were going to be four hours ended up being six or eight hours. And, as, and, I would, and I would add, they didn't fully enroll their trial because they were very you know, strict in their inclusion and exclusion criteria and because a lot of people can't take that much time you know, to, to do these. So the, um, the medication, this was that bad blood pressure medicine I was talking about, ritigamine. Um, they're about to take it off the market because you know, people weren't prescribing it for blood pressure. So the, um, the principal investigator there, is that not true? Oh, sorry. It's anti-epileptic. The BP drug is a different one. Um, uh, this guy, Brian Wanger, who is not really a clinician. He's a, more of a lab worker. He was beginning to think all this work that was going into this trial was just going to be wasted. And so he thought, well, here's someone who participated. Let's do a webinar and encourage talk about what it's like to be in the trial and try to encourage more people to join. I don't know if they fully enrolled or not. But um, it, it was, it, it's a very hopeful trial. That's one of the reasons they were pushing on this one, is that it's attacking ALS in a different way. The other thing, I, the other thing I'll say generally about clinical trials is that um, uh, less than, fewer than 5% of, uh, of patients um, participate in clinical trials. It's true with ALS, it's also true in the cancer space, it's true across most diseases. The only tr tr um, disease groups where you can see participation rates at 25 or 50 percent are typically diseases that affect infant children, where the parents are the ones making the decisions to, to enroll them. Um, so when I talk about trying to in increase participation, you know, get doubling that participation rate from four percent to eight percent would change the research landscape while also recognizing that there are huge sections of uh, huge swaths of ALS patients who are too ge geographically isolated, 
uh, too, too medically far gone, any number of other reasons, unable to participate. So I'm not holding out the hope that you'll be able to get um, people in those more extreme situations enrolled. But for someone like me who lives 10 miles outside of Boston and, and can get in, can hop on the, the, uh, uh, the commuter train in Lincoln and ride into North Station, walk to Mass General, participate in the trial, and be home for dinner, uh, it, was, it was very easy for me to do. And, and so I, um, uh, I have spoken with many, many people about just saying it is possible, and please at least think about it. Um, there's one trial that I've been in for about two years that um, where they took uh, some skin samples from my arm, converted the skin cells into pluripotent stem cells, and converted them into motor neuron cells that are actually Stephen Winthrop motor neuron cells. And those were in a freezer in Cambridge uh, so that they can actually test in vitro to see how those cells respond and react to, to different organisms and, and, uh, um, and drugs. So it's, it's the, the science is really very exciting right now. You gotta go a little faster, sorry yeah. Will. Advocacy is a, is a um, some people call it lobbying. Uh, some people call it arm twisting. Um, <laughs> The ALS Association has a very, very well-developed um, advocacy arm. And Jane and I have been uh, to Washington now uh, for a long weekend in May for the last three years, getting to know members of our congressional delegation. And uh, particularly in this political climate, and the political climate we've been li living in for the last several years, it's nothing short of remarkable that we have this list of successes to point to. I'm actually not going to go into the weeds of what each one of these is about, but they are they are they fall into basically two categories. One is trying to get um, benefits to pe things like um, SSDI and Medicaid to people with ALS uh, faster, and the other is to uh, try to persuade um, congressmen and senators to support. Uh, research funding, and one phrase that I heard that I really grabbed onto, when you look at the amount of money we're looking for for some of these things, it's about $10 million a year, and the term that somebody used was, that's budget dust. <laughs> when, when, when you look at the federal budget, it's $10 million is nothing, but it's a huge amount. And in fact, the federal government is the single largest um, funder of research of it for ALS in the country, mostly through um, uh, the, um, help me out. The, uh, uh, NIH? Yeah, NIH, thank you, National Institutes of Health. Pictures. So um, I joke, that picture on the upper left where Stephen and I are standing in front of the Capitol, um, if it was just Mr. and Mrs. Smith go to Washington, um, not much would happen. So um, the one down below is um, the Massachusetts delegation that year. Um, and I told them, we're going to charge Capitol Hill. And so they all did a thumbs up thing. But, um, and the picture on the right, um, at these advocacy conferences that, we, that um, are every year where we go, there are 600 people um, who come. And they're, of course, covering all 50 states. And we, we get all trained. And we're all going to ask the exact same thing. And then we go out on Hill Day and, and talk to our um, representatives. And this uh, past year, there were 130 pals who were there. And they took a picture here. Stephen is of, yeah, you probably can't tell most are in wheelchairs, but Stephen is, of course, like usual, if you play Where's Waldo, he's dead center. Um, he's, yep, he's right here. He's squatting down on the floor, talking, because that's our good friend, Shelly who's um, beside him, but um, these, as you can imagine, are really effective advocates. And we, um, we go, we tell our stories, mostly is what, what they want to hear. And they've told us this, that they, it's the, the individual stories that makes a difference. Usually we meet with a legislative aide who looks like a kid, um, but sometimes we get meetings with our legislators themselves. There's Elizabeth Warren, who we've met a few times against the Capitol building, there she is. 
Um, we met Senator Markey, but we didn't get a photo op with him. Um, on the lower right, that's Nikki Songus, who's about to retire from Congress. Uh, we were meeting with her aide, and we were all crying, actually, at the time. And Nikki walked in, was like, whoa, dry tears, and quick, get a picture. And then that ends up um, being tweeted. Uh, she's tagged. Um, people do all this stuff to just to keep the conversation going. The more people who are more people are following Nikki Songus or Elizabeth Warren than they are us. So um, that's one way you make a difference. And upper right, that's um, Representative Seth Moulton. He is a mass rep from the North Shore. You can see Nancy Frades to the left of Stephen standing there. She's the mother of Pete Frades, the Ice Bucket Challenge. She lives up there in Beverly, and that's his territory. Um, he is signing a bill. Um, which is where he announced it here. Um, a couple of our friends are here who were at this event. We went to the Frady's house, learned a lot about what it's like to introduce a bill. Because this was introduced in February, but then they had this big splashy announcement back in the district in March. Um, they're my kids in the bottom right. Uh, Casey and Hannah are there with Stephen and me. We were all um, standing behind um, the podium as one after another people got up and spoke about how great this bill is going to be. It's, it's to help um, people with ALS qualify for, they qualify for disability immediately, but they, they hold back the checks for five months. But some people are dead by the time that happens. So we're trying to tell them, like, don't give them a waiting period. Waiting periods are for people that you're worried it's fraud, and it's not fraud with ALS. Um, but they had, you know, people from Mass General. They had people from uh, other research groups, and Stephen spoke as a, as a patient, Pete was there, of course, his wife spoke, um, and Seth Moulton made this big thing. It was just a really interesting um, thing when you always see those people standing behind um, a politician, you know, when they're doing it, those are selected people. <laughs> there's, there's a reason each one of them is there. Um, yeah, I'll clip this back on, because this is the um, FDA. Um, Steven's been doing some amazing work with them, but he's going to do it, summarize it briefly. <laughs> um, unfortunately, a lot of people think of the FDA as being, and the government more generally, as being something that stands in the way of uh, effective treatments getting to patients. Um, and that's only partially true. The FDA came to the ALS Association. Let's see if I can lean this towards me. Um, um, the FDA came to the ALS Association and said, we would really like to have a, the definitive document on ALS uh, published through us. But we, we don't have the staffing. We don't have the skill set. Can you guys make it happen? And we pulled together. Uh, 19 different organizations, um, people from industry, people from academia, from research, uh, as well as a group of about 35 patients and caregivers. And I was the chair of that group. Um, and uh, it, um, again, that slide on the left is an eye burner. I'm not going to go into the details. But um, suffice it to say that the FDA um, uh, listened. And our group wrote a companion document that was a, um, about a five-pager that said what was most important to the patient and caregiver population. I'm going to do one policy geek step aside here because I think it's actually very interesting um, uh, for people who are interested in, in how, what the government does when it works and when it doesn't work. The FDA, as all of you can, I'm sure, imagine, came into existence because of sneak oil salesmen and people peddling drugs that either did nothing or actually did harm. And I fully embrace the notion that we need a government agency that stops uh, that from happening. Um, but you allow an agency or uh, an organization to, to structure its thinking entirely around, we have one type of error that we want to, that we want to avoid at all costs. And that one type of error is to stop bad drugs from getting into circulation. When you're in that mindset, it is not only uh, predictable, but it actually happens that you are going to occasionally stop a good drug from getting through into circulation. And uh, those of us in the ALS community said, um, uh, without being too facetious here, we're not talking about 
uh, acne or male pattern baldness, we're talking about a disease that um, has uh, no effective treatment, no cure. And please, if a drug passes certain safety standards, um, and we were specific about what those safety standards were, if, if a drug can, drug can be proven to be safe, please do what you can to get the drug out and into patients' hands because patients would, with ALS would rather have a crack at something that might work than to have to sit and do nothing and die. And I did that groundbreaking approval. Um, I don't know if you follow the, the second drug ever for it that um, is a treatment for ALS that slows the progression by as much as as much as thirty percent in the trial. Um, Radicava it came. It was approved in May. Um, Stephen actually just started his first treatment of it um, nine days ago. But um, what was groundbreaking about this, why it's way beyond ALS, is this is the first time the FDA approved a drug without requiring American trials. This was, this had been used in Japan for years. It had passed all the Japanese approvals, but you know, you hear that a lot of times with things, right? Oh, it's being used in Canada, it's being used in France, but the FDA won't do it until you do your own trials. But they listened to this guidance document group and said, you know what, it's really working, it looks safe, we wanna get this out there to patients. That was, that was quite amazing actually from a policy perspective and it opens it up for other diseases as well then there's a I'm gonna give Stephen a break for this voice so um, I'm grateful Casey's sitting here in the front row um, Casey was the first one in our family to do any fundraising she did a he did a bike ride for ALS and um, at the end of it uh, Stephen was there and was talking to the uh, head of the mass chapter and talking to the head of the board, and Casey came up afterwards and said, Dad, why aren't you doing that? And Stephen said, oh, yeah, that's a good question. I do boards. Why don't I do that board? So he he ended up um, contacting the nominating committee and ended up on the National Board of Trustees for the ALS Association. There was a, um, a PALS already on the board, um, so he was the second one brought on, but then in April, um, their chair stepped down. Um, the other PALS had since died. And when their chair stepped down, everyone came to Stephen and said, hate to do this to you, don't want to give you the stress, but it would be awesome if you would become chair. And he did. And this is a picture of Stephen speaking to that advocacy conference of the 600 people newly elected as chair. This is the first time there's been a person with ALS um, as the chairman of the board. It's given the community a lot of hope. Um, I'm just gonna run through these. Um, fundraising, the necessary evil. We've gotten this far without talking too much about money. Um, I know that uh, NPR sometimes says, buy the numbers. So 200000 a year is what it costs to take care of someone with ALS. You can understand why so many of them declare bankruptcy um, and end up getting Medicaid. Um, oftentimes uh, with divorce. Uh, $115 million is what the uh, ALS Association received from the Ice Bucket Challenge that one year, uh, not so much the next year or the next or the next. 220 million worldwide, 115 million here in the US at the ALS Association. Um, but <coughs> $2 billion is what it costs to bring one drug to market. From the very initial lab studies, you know, with the, in the Petri dishes, then the mice, then whatever, all the way to fruition. So, and every drop adds up, I put that in, because that was, the um, ALS Association's motto, I don't know, one, year, one of the years after the Ice Bucket Challenge, and I firmly believe that. That is, um, we've seen it happen in our own lives. Because we calculated, we estimate, we have raised about $4 million in four years um, for research and for patient care. And that is drop by drop and dollar by dollar and step by step. These are the groups we've raised money for. Um, the ALS Association nationally and the Mass Chapter. The Mass Chapter mostly uh, funds patient care, like all the local chapters do. They have staff who will go out and visit patients and um, provide them with care because not everyone can afford $200,000 a year in treatment. Um, insurance covers 
not enough. So their staff tries to fill in that gap. But Massachusetts has been so incredibly successful in its fundraising, and I would say in no small part to a certain team of walkers here, um, that they have um, extra money that wasn't budgeted, and they give it to research to our, um, our Massachusetts researchers here. And you know this is the heart of medical research. Mass General, MGH, um, which now wants to be called Mass General, I guess, um, they have the premier ALS clinic in the country. We looked around. I was willing to move our family to, you didn't know this, to Jerusalem, <laughs> Berlin, I, you know, wherever it was that the best stuff was happening. And we learned that it's happening right here, which is a huge relief. Um, we have the best um, team there. Harvard Brain Science Initiative, which is doing lab research, really um, a lot of stem cell work. Harvard is, is, it's, is kind of claiming as its uh, specialty versus, say, genetic work that's happening in other universities. ALS-1, a more recent um, nonprofit founded here in Massachusetts. It combines different medical schools and ALS-TDI, which is a nonprofit um, biotech in Cambridge, and doctors and, it, and caregivers. And it brought them all together because one patient who had an incredible drive said, why are we infighting? Let's, let's work together, one, until we are ALS done. That's his, that's his thing. Steven serves on the board of that. Oh, our walk team. We're the purple people. Th this was our, um, our walk team in 2016, last year. We had 90 walkers, about. Um, we raised, well, over the three years, we've raised about $170,000 for the Mass Chapter. We're really proud of our team. Um, a lot of you here were, are in that photo, and I won't call you out. Um, it is, we're, Stephen and I are the co-captains of that team, and it is the funnest fundraising we do, I gotta say. You can see all the smiles in that picture. That was, yeah, if you see it, we're kneeling down the front row, and our kids are right there. My father, who is the who's here in the front row. My father was the oldest walker in Massachusetts. That year he was 97. Uh, he walked again this year at 98. We were thrilled. There are lots of dogs usually that walk. Some of them are wearing shirts. It's, it's really quite the event. It's not just a fundraiser. It is a, a, a support, just incredible support. And it usually buoys us for months and months afterwards. Um, so many people with such goodwill. It's the best fundraising. Uh, that ALS-1 just got approved, the first um, license plate in Massachusetts that will um, take all the money that if you buy this vanity plate, it will go toward ALS research. Um, they needed 750 people, 750, to g get one of these plates going. You know, you see the whale tails or Red Sox or whatever. Um, and the LG, they, all these, these specialty plates have two letters and the LG is for Lou Gehrig, right. Um, so we're going to be having one of those. I think from, from here on out, it will be $40 a year to get a plate like this, which is pretty reasonable. Um, and it's one of the ways you can support ALS research. Ah. You know we're getting near the end, right? <laughs> what can you do? Um, well, you know, as with any disease or any person who's going through anything tough, um, offers of time are really helpful. Whether you offer to do errands for someone um, with ALS or grocery shopping or sit with the person with ALS for an hour or two so that the caregiver gets a break. Maybe they want to be the one grocery shopping and you can sit there with them. You can do fix-it jobs around the house. That kind of thing. That gift of time doesn't cost you anything out of your pocket is really, really great. Um, in terms of what can you do, uh, this is not the hard fundraising pitch. Um, Charity Miles is an app that you can download onto your phone and it's, it's gonna sound too good to be true, but it in fact is true. If you have this app running on your phone, you sign in, you create an account, you choose the charity you want to support, and it measures your steps. 
And um, all you have to do when you open up the app on your phone is to endure an ad. In, in our case, it's for uh, egg whites. You have to endure the, an ad. The advertisers are the, the revenue source for this. Uh, every mile you walk um, brings 10 cents to the charity that you've chosen without it being a penny out of your pocket. And this is a perfect thing for young people, um, high school, college students who are probably walking 10,000 steps and don't know it every day. Uh, perfect way to, um, to generate money. They don't mind having that one app running in the background of their phone. We've already, Jane mentioned the license plates. Um, the, uh, the, the lower left is uh, just one example of, of um, a clinical trial which enrolls some uh, healthy controls. So if you're willing to go into Mass General and have a couple of vials of blood drawn from your arm, um, and, answer and answer some questions, you're done. And it's um, hugely beneficial, again, for that learning. Uh, um, of, uh, and then lastly, the walk to defeat ALS. Jane just talked about that. There are about 200 of these across the country every year, four of them here in Massachusetts. And um, it's not only a fundraiser, but it's also, as Jane said, a huge um, shot in the arm for those of us with ALS, you were there at the walks. Um, there's also, this is just two years old, um, uh, there was a widow of um, someone with ALS who had uh, young children, and her, Jody O'Donnell Ames, and her thing that she decided to do after he had passed was to create a camp for children and grandchildren of people with ALS, and it would be free for them. And a lot of these kids are caregivers themselves. Um, there are young teens, preteens, who are responsible for many hours a day for their parents' care. And to come to camp and be a kid is a huge break. And not just that, but to come to a camp with kids who get it. And they have social workers, and they have um, psychologists, and they have arts and crafts, but they take volunteers on all kinds of ways. If you want to spend a weekend at camp, um, you can be drawing with little kids, or you can be um, showing them how to fish. Um, this upper right picture, that's uh, Casey and Hannah, who were um, at the camp uh, a year ago, and that the woman in the middle used to be a research coordinator at Mass General. She was coming as a volunteer because she's now a um, clinical psychologist grad student. So um, it is such an amazing um, little nonprofit, and volunteering for them is another thing you could do. Where is, well, where is it? This one was in the Berkshires. Um, the organization, Hope Loves Company, that was at a Y in it, I think. Am I right? I think it was a, a YMCA camp. Uh, it wasn't the best location. They had to wear life vests even when they were in water up to their knees. <coughs> uh, so they found a different location afterwards. But yeah, they do it out in the Berkshires for a weekend in August. Um, and the ALS Association of Massachusetts um, helps to fund that. Okay, I, I said I wouldn't read slides, but this one, you, you may not be able to see the bottom. Here's poor Alan in the chair. It says, only Alan was prepared to acknowledge the elephant in the room. And of course, what we've been talking about is talking about it. You know, acknowledging that someone has ALS, talk with them about it, ask questions. Not everybody wants to talk about it, but it is totally okay to ask questions. We try to be um, as open as possible. And mostly, we appreciate that you all came tonight. I really had no idea if anybody would come. Um, but lots of people, including people who, some people who are very close to us, feel awkward talking about ALS or asking questions. And we certainly can't speak for every uh, person with ALS. But for us, we welcome it. We appreciate it. And um, I actually wrote this line, so I'm going to read this one. That talking about the disease lessens the weight of the elephant in the room. Thank you all so much. And we <laughs> so as I mentioned, there are cookies and brownies, unless you've eaten them all, in the back, and coffee and tea. We are happy to take any questions if there's anything we actually haven't covered already. Um, we're happy to 
answer any questions you have because that goes with but or yes Ross so the question is how many phase three clinical trials have occurred that means phase three is when it has gone through uh, safety you know in a, a very small study phase one where they're just seeing if it's safe then phase two they work on dosing and efficacy a little bit on efficacy but they're really trying to figure out what happens if you give them more of it or less of it phase three you've gone through these hurdles you tend to do a very large trial if possible enrolling lots and lots of people and this is the one where you're really crossing your fingers and saying okay half are you getting placebo half are you getting the drug let's see what happens one of the things that we talked about in that FDA guidance document was to try to take the um, philosophy of venture capital to the clinical trial, and particularly the, the, the phase one, phase two, phase three structure of clinical trials. Insofar as you want to encourage risk taking, but you want, uh, you want to take many, many small risks. You don't want to bet the farm on a phase three trial and have it fail. To answer your question, Ross, in the last 20 years, there have probably been on the order of magnitude of maybe 10 that have made it to phase three. And um, uh, one of the more um, spectacular um, uh, failures was a drug that was developed by Biogen here in Boston. And it was a drug that made it to phase three, which is where you're really trying to figure out, does the drug do what you think it does without people's toes falling off or other bad things from happening. Phase two is mostly about safety. Um, but you're also measuring efficacy. You're also measuring the impact of the drug what ha and, and dosing in phase two. What happened in the phase two of this particular trial was I talked at the very beginning about the variability of uh, the disease. Um, and uh, um, this hasn't been fully established scientifically, but it's pretty well recognized that what happened was they had a placebo arm in their phase two trial. And, the, and it just so happened, as can happen with statistical randomness, that they got a lot of rapid progressors in that placebo group. So the treatment group looked as if they did better than the placebo group because the placebo group just happened to have a cluster of these rapid progressors in it. So they looked at the phase two results and went, hey, Eureka, $50 million was, was thrown into the, um, the phase three uh, trial. And still to this day, Jane and I are meeting people from Biogen who threw themselves, threw every bit of themselves into this study and talking with them about this drug is like talking about um, a child that died. I mean, it's, it's just a, a profound and horrible loss for everybody who worked there. Um, so we all want to see um, uh, a fewer of those phase three failures. And instead, the, the ALS Association and other funders are focusing on a lot of the preclinical trials and then the phase one and the phase two trials, because that's where the real impact is, is likely to be felt if we can fill the pipeline at those earlier stages. Nancy. Do we know what causes ALS is the question. Is there an ALS gene? Well, 10% of the cases are familial where if you took, did a family tree, you could see, you know, oh, I had an uncle who had that cousin, and then, the, you know, actually my, my father's father, you know, whatever. And I'm just using male relatives because they stuck in my head, but it, it could be whatever. So those people have a familial form. It clearly is hereditary. They haven't found a gene that labels all of them. They have now found two um, genes that Oh, and by the way, and then the other 90% of the cases, no idea. Like Stephen, th no clue what causes this. There's no environmental factor they've found. There's no nothing else, no reason. Um, they have found two genes in the last 15 years that show up in some of those familial cases, and um, a few of them even in the ones that are not familial. 
but it, it is a small slice of the um, of the ALS population. However, the scientists we've spoken to think that gene therapy is the most exciting thing to come. They think we just haven't found maybe the right mutation in the right gene to be able to do its work on it. Um, I don't know. Uh, there was a there's a disease called Duchenne's, sometimes known as like Duch Duchenne muscular dystrophy. It's like little kid ALS. Really sad, sad. Children never uh, don't really develop. They don't develop muscles, and they usually um, die by age two. And um, they came up with this novel approach where they send in a a virus. I hope I'm speaking correctly. They send in a virus which goes into the genes and and changes that mutation. Like it, it gets rid of the bad proteins in there and shuts it off and these children are able to move for the first time babies are able to roll over they're living longer it, it is it is um, miraculous but it's science progress and we're hoping we can take that same kind of technology forward into other neurological diseases yeah. uh, Nancy in, in total there have been about 30 genes identified thus far that have some kind of a link to ALS um, but um, if you add them all up they account for um, somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of the cases. Um, the current thinking, and boy, in the, just in the last five years, the amount that's been learned has come along by leaps and bounds. But the current thinking is that they'll probably find more genetic links, and that, um, like with many diseases, uh, none of these genes, if you have that mutation, does it mean that you will get the disease? It's just an increased likelihood of getting the disease. Um, and uh, my my joke is that you know they may find out sometime in the distant future that um, I got ALS because um, I got a couple of concussions when I was a kid when people didn't even pay attention to concussions. And maybe maybe a link there. And combine that with. Um, swimming with my mouth open in lakes that had uh, blue-green algae, where there's some question as to whether blue-green algae plays a role, and combine that with <coughs> the fictional possibility that my mother ate lima beans during her third month of pregnancy under a full moon, um, that, you know, that, it, that it could be a combination of, of a lot of different factors, which together, uh, I mean, f I think it's fascinating from, the, from a scientific standpoint to study um, how is it that there are chain smokers who don't get lung cancer? Is there, is there a prote protective mutation that, that um, saves them? So there are families, I happen to be from a very large family, and nobody on my family tree has had ALS. Um, but I, um, uh, it's, I think actually the cause of the disease is probably going to be one of the very last things that we come to understand. That, um, the, the gene silencing that Jane was describing uh, a moment ago is in many ways the most exciting development right now, being able to go to families that carry one of these more predominant genes and being able to um, uh, knock the disease out before it starts. I mean, that's, that's a huge win. That's Nobel Prize kind of stuff. Um, and that the other very exciting area of research is um, in identifying what are called biomarkers, which are any type, any kind of thing, a signal from your body, blood or a scan or other things. The biomarkers will allow us to, to diagnose sooner, to treat sooner, and to learn more about the mechanisms of the disease. I think we're going to stop there. And if anybody you know, wants to ask us more questions, we're here. Um, after, we'll probably Stephen will probably give you his cell phone number if you want to talk to him anytime. But we're, again, we're so grateful you came. Thank you.